people will see the artificial intelligence level rising and rising and rising. Never in history has there been so much at stake. So we're talking about the survival of a species. Once they, re they reach human level intelligence, they can redesign themselves. And then those super creatures could redesign themselves and create super duper creatures and so on. Implicit in, in that vast neural net is like entire human knowledge. This issue will dominate our global politics. And, and that's the source of this bitter conflict that I see coming. That would be a kind of global civil war. It scares people shitless. Humanity will be asking, do we build gods or do we build our potential exterminated? Talking about the po possible death of billions of people. You have talked about how Ted, you think that Ted Kaczynski might have been like the first manifestation of this Terran mentality, this anti-tech, very aggressively Luddite type mentality. Do people have to see something in order to really become that scared that they start to blow up data centers and things of that nature? Or what do you think has to happen before the Terrans actually start to get that active? I think the answer to that question depends on how quickly the so-called takeoff is. Are you familiar with that concept? The, the takeoff is the time between machines reaching more or less human level intelligence before they become super intelligent and then super duper intelligence so they you know they can read once they re they reach human level intelligence they can redesign themselves so then they have the intelligence to do that they, they could improve their circuitry their memory uh their intelligence and so forth and and then those super creatures could redesign themselves and create super duper creatures and so on so you get an exponential increase in, in intelligence, it just you know, it just takes off. Now, if if that takeoff time is very fast, then there won't be enough time for human politics to unfold, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 they just come into being their fate complete. They're just there, and then hopefully these artifacts, these creatures, might just treat us as ants, ignore us, so so we survive as a species. That, that's one scenario, that's a possibility. But what I'm really afraid of is if, when, the takeoff is slow. Because imagine uh, what's happening now with, say, chat, GPT, and so forth. Imagine that that's not sufficient. These GBTs, these, these uh, pieces of engineering, in a sense, are stupid. They don't have a model of the world. They don't understand the world in, in, in a certain sense. The major reason why people are so shocked by chat GPT is that it can write essays at a level superior to about 90% of humans. I mean, that that is shocking. That is amazing. But these these devices, these these softwares, they, they, they don't have a model of the world. They don't understand the world. They're just, in a sense, idiot savants. They do one thing well. So they can manipulate images, make text, uh, generate speech, and so forth. So you can actually communicate with them. So in that sense, that's amazing for people. But they're not like our human brains. It's a different kind of intelligence. And so maybe to 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 create uh, AGI, as you, as you put it, artificial general intelligence, that they are AIs that can solve general problems. They're, they're not just specialists in one thing, like like Google is a specialist for. Uh, search and self-driving cars are, are good at that, but they don't have a general intelligence. So to, to generate AGI, maybe, I'm not, I can't be certain, but maybe uh, we will need to build uh, artificial brains that, that have a brain-like intelligence, that, that have a model of the world and, and that kind of thing. And, and doing that, will be very difficult. You know, as we were saying a bit before, but, you know, there's 86 billion brain cells in, in the brain and with a quadrillion connections. So so maybe building human level intelligence and hence artificial brains, maybe, is a very difficult problem. So there'll be plenty of time for human politics to unfold. And and people will see, or millions of people will see 
year by year, the artificial intelligence level rising and rising and rising. So there'll be lots of time for people to ask those you know, those questions I mentioned before. You know, are these machines going to reach human level intelligence? Could they go beyond us? Could they go be way beyond us? And, and I'm saying yes, like trillions and trillions of times above us and so on. And and that's a real threat. And so uh, I see political parties being formed over this issue. In fact, there is already a political party in the US, the, the Transhumanist Party. So uh, as, as this species dominance debate heats up, I, I can imagine there'll be uh, cosmos parties and Terran parties and cyborg parties and so forth. Why? This issue will dominate our global politics because never in history has there been so much at stake. And, and what's that? Well, the survival of the human species. So if, if there's a major war, this Artelec war that I'm predicting be between the Cosmos and the Terrans, that would be a kind of global civil war, you know, planetary, you know, be, because the world keeps shrinking. Like, like uh, I, call, I call this phenomenon BRAD, B-R-A-D, that's bit rate annual doubling. In other words, the internet doubles in speed every year. And, and, and I don't see any limit to how small you can put one bit of information on. I suppose you could go right down to quarks or gluons. Or, you know. so, so I see this BRAD, B-R-A-D phenomenon uh, just continuing for you know, many, many years, decades. So imagine well, it's, what's almost impossible. But try to imagine what an internet that was a trillion times faster, you know, the bit rate, the, the number of bits you could transfer. What could you do with such, you know, such a thing? Well, uh, well before a trillion, you you could present uh, three dimensional images to everyone. I mean, if you think about it, just watching something, what's happening? You're getting a zillion photons coming into your eye from from the real world. Well, if you could it's simulate that, if you, if you could have a zillion photons coming into your eye from a machine, you wouldn't be able to distinguish reality from. Well, reality, right? VR against RR. I mean, the, the very concept of reality would sort of disappear in a sense. So uh, with this fabulous uh, super uh, um, internet coming, uh, I, I see the world you know, culturally homogenizing, world language. Uh, we, you know, we'll be pretty much the same. Ideas would travel across the planet easily. Everyone would speak the same global language, etc. So uh, a global state that I, that I call GLOBA, G-L-O-B-A. And in that context, you know, hopefully no more wars except for this big one. So in a global state, um, you have a global police and, and uh, presumably uh, totally democratic, so you don't get a dictatorship that's planetary, but a global uh, uh, democratic state. But even, even with those guys... This artelect issue, you know, species dominance issue, will not go away. I, I, I see it just dominating. And so if, if there's a major war in that context of a, of a global state, it would be a global civil war. And, you know, hence, hence, the, hence the doom and gloom. And, I, you know, I thought my age, given my age, I would not see it. I'd see, I'd see the artelect debate heat up. I certainly imagine that. But now with the rise of chat GPT you know, the, the large language models and the computing capacity now is pretty well equal to that of the human brain in, in terms of bits per second. But what's, what's an artificial neuron? So imagine just a circle and lines converging into that circle. Those lines, they represent signals, you know, voltages coming in, you know, pulses of electricity. Those signals coming in, they're, they're just a number, like you know, the voltage number. You've got in, inputs coming in with signals coming in of, of various signal strengths, and you multiply each each of those signals by a weight, that's just a number, and you add them all up, and then depending on what that sum is, that will determine, yes or no, whether that neuron will fire, whether it will send out a signal. That That's effectively what a... a uh, an artificial neuron is. Today's computers have roughly the same number of connections or weights, if you like, as, as the human brain. And 
increasing by an order of magnitude per year, which is just staggering. So, uh, you know, given that, um, there's another major development that's coming. Uh, it might be out a year or two, that sort of time frame. Uh, let's see. What What is the name of the British genius behind Mathematica? I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> Stephen uh, Wolfram. Stephen okay, yeah. Wolfram. Okay. Now, uh, he has teamed up with um, OpenAI. Okay, so they, those those two have teamed up. And uh, the aim is to, to, to give chat uh, GPT uh, the ability to reason scientifically, memory, logic, and all that kind of stuff. So at the, at the moment, GPT is, is essentially just an idiot savant. All, all it's really doing is it's looking at a string of words and then predicting what the next word will be. You know, and, and it does that based on you know, massive statistics that uh, it's created by reading you know, the whole internet and millions of books and so on. So it's built up all these statistics on what the probability is. You know, given these words before, what's the next word? Just, just so, so what is a GPT? It's a massive neural network, right, with hundreds of billions, with a B, hundreds of billions of artificial neurons. And its task is basically to you know, find the next word. And it does that based on its knowledge of having read the entire new, um, internet and millions of books. So implicit in, in that vast uh, neural net is like entire human knowledge. But, but it doesn't understand the world in a sense. So uh, hopefully with Wolfram and other, other people like that, giving this fantastically huge capable neural net the ability to reason and remember and do logic and deduce and, and, and so on and induce in, induction. Uh, it, it will it will be as big a revolution as GPT was. And mm. it's, only, it's only the last few months with GPT-4 coming out that's just blown people away because of the quality of the text that it creates and images. I mean, soon you will have... Um, I mean, I, I've, I've seen... Artificial image, you know, deep fake. Yeah. They are so they are so lifelike. You can't tell the difference, literally. So so it, and and but these are static. You know, they're just photos, they're, well, images, static. But pretty soon they will be uh, generating whole movies. Right. So what what impact what impacts are they going to have in Hollywood? Well, it's going to kill it. And mm -hmm. and people who uh, authors who, who write fiction. They're going to be replaced. So, uh, in the next couple of years, uh, the it's possible then that perhaps the displacement of all these workers, these people may start to be what foments the Terran mindset because they've been displaced from their jobs. Is it possible that that's how this starts? That that's definitely one scenario, because uh, I'm predicting just in the next few years, millions of people will lose their jobs. Now, am I worried about that? Not too much, because um, you know I read, I, I write, I try to read fairly generally, even fairly widely, and I've read that uh, if you're interested in cultural anthropology, those guys they estimate there are about five to ten thousand different cultures on the planet. And in some of them, they only work two or three hours a day. So how, how do they fill their day? Well, with makeup rituals and religion and ceremony, they have a rich cultural life. And, and they're not worried about you know, not having a job or work because you know, their basics are taken care of. Now, I can imagine uh, when millions of uh, people lose their jobs because of AI, then governments will be forced. I mean, they'll have to. Otherwise, it's a revolution. They will have to implement the system of, you've probably heard of it, UBI, Universal Basic Income. In other words, government's just giving money to, to people so, so that they can you know, survive. And, and then once that happens, you know, the pe people are not threatened by the you know, mm -hmm. uh, threat to their very existence. It's not an existential threat to them. So they just develop other things. They'll become like these other cultures. So, so I'm not too worried about... Uh, 
mass um, unemployment. And, and, and I see that coming because as, as machines progressively become more intelligent, then there will be a human employable threshold intelligence needed. So if, if you're going to rem remain employable, you'll have to have a very high IQ because the machines are getting smarter and smarter every year. Eventually, the machines will get so smart that virtually nobody will be employable. And by that's, you know, and then with UBI and so on, I, I, I mentioned these machines will be fantastically productive, right? They, 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 you know, working at very high speeds and with high intelligence, producing all the goods and services that, that we need. So everyone will be rich. I mean, super rich. Even you know, the poorest region in the world, they will all be rich. That that's coming. So in that sense, uh, AI is very positive. But long to the one, one of the reasons I fell out with the transhumanists was uh, I, I felt they didn't really bite the bullet. You know, they were talking about all these wonderful positive things that would happen. You know, like you just talked about, you know, everyone getting rich, getting rid of death. You know. Uh, using nanotechnology, you're putting in. So, so, what is nanotechnology? It's it's molecular scale machines, molecular scale engineering. Uh, ultimately, it's sort of mechanical chemistry. It's like uh, imagine a, a nanoscale robot, and it's capable of picking up one atom here and putting it there. Yeah, I've seen I've seen the nanoscale 3D printer concept and. You know, the, the machine that you just type what you want and it builds it from atoms. Right. So uh, I don't know if you're a fan or was a fan of um, Next Generation Star Trek series, uh, the the replicator. You know, so Captain Kirk or whatever, he goes up to the wall and says, Earl Grey tea. And so you know, his tea just gets manufactured, you know, atom by atom. Uh, at, at high speed. And so the whole concept of scarcity in the 24th century, you know, when Star Trek is supposed to take place, uh, it becomes irrelevant. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so AI could produce all that. And I, I don't deny that. I, I think in that sense, AI will be a wonderful thing for, for humanity. But what really worries me is the bigger, deeper, longer-term question of species dominance. And, you know, and then you start arguing as a Terran, well, these creatures could, they have the ability to get rid of us. And, and what is an acceptable risk? And given the stake is the whole planet, you know, survival of the whole human species, the only risk you will accept is zero. And, and that's the source of this bitter conflict that I see coming. And uh, as you talk about the fate accompli, which is the, perhaps, w what do you think that singularity where the AI becomes conscious, what do you believe has to happen for that to happen? Like I've, I've been thinking lately about robotics and how perhaps these language models need some sort of sensory modality to have a interaction with the world like maybe once it gets integrated to the robot level where it can interact and then it starts to, I mean, there's Blake Lemoyne who's talked about the Google DeepMind, how it was worried about, you know, its own survival. But is that just a, like you say, is that just it spitting out the next word in the string that it uh, predicts or is it actually understanding that on a visceral level do, do you think that the integration with robotics is required for the singularity as it's often referred? Or do you think that that could just manifest in the software itself without any hardware, um, any hardware appendages? Uh, it's a tough question. Uh, personally, I do think that uh, it's a sufficient condition in other words, once you know, once these GPTs and so forth, once they do get integrated into robots, you know, your physical bodies in a sense, and they interact with the world, then they will build up a, a knowledge, a model of the world. I, I see that 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 could happen, but whether that's necessary, 
that I'm not so sure. That, that's a really tough question because mm-hmm. um, I, I think what's pe- uh, the, the, the intelligists, you know, the, the specialists, the professors, the researchers in AI, I just call them intelligists, uh, they are becoming increasingly conscious that GPT is a different kind of intelligence from, from ours. Uh, it, you know, it has the ability to generate these wonderful essays at, at a level above the, you know, uh, maybe only about 10% of the human population could write a higher quality essay than, than they're doing today. So who, who, know, you know, who knows what they might, there, there may be other kinds of intelligence that human beings haven't even thought of yet. But, but I do think once uh, these systems are put into bodies, you know, robots and so forth, then and they they explore the world and, and like like a baby you know it, it has to discover its own legs and arms and you know all this stuff so so I can imagine these machines going through a similar process as human babies go through you know learning about the world and themselves and, and you know it seems to me a fairly small step once they reach uh, human level intelligence they, they'll be reasoned and, and, and if they have brain like uh, structures like us then it seems to me a small step to say, well, what, what about my existence? You know, and, and these humans, well, they're a threat. You know? And then, then you get the, you know, what is it, uh, the Terminator, you know, the Skynet scenario. That, you know, these, these Hollywood types, they're smart. They, they get there before the scientists because they don't have to do the work, right? They just, yeah. they just put their, their fantasies into film. And, and get there like decades ahead of the scientists and the politicians because you know they're, they're not obligated to do the work they, they just you know, write their scripts and film it but uh, I, I do have whoever wrote the scripts for the Terminator series I have a great admiration I, I, I think they were visionary there's a, there's a lot of plausibility behind their scripts I agree and you know for them to be talking about neural networks in the 80s you know and uh like skynet you know before the internet was even really uh popular was was quite prescient for sure do you think that go ahead did you you see the movie uh transcendence yes that was with johnny depp right i i can't i can't quite remember it but I know you you talk about how transcendence is a ripoff of your book in some in some cases or inspired by I guess we can euphemistically say. But so uh, I, I think they did have a, a technical advisor telling them you know what what correct technical buzzwords to use in the script in the movie because you know they were talking about quantum computers and neural networks and uh, they had all the latest stuff in it because a fairly fairly recent movie. But, nearly a decade ago so um yeah hollywood is really listening to to what the tech tech guys are saying and then then jump ahead you know a decade or two or three yeah i find i i don't know if you find this but i find in these movies they they almost always exaggerate the hardware but they always underestimate the software with the exception of like the matrix like if you think of like star wars or something you know they they have this giant planet-sized spaceship, but Darth Vader has like a few buttons on his chest, you know? Like they always underestimate because they can't really visualize the software, but they, they can visualize these giant machines. So that's just a, a, a sidebar um, going on tangents here. But uh, in terms of the Terrans, you know, do you think that the people like, because I can imagine and I'm not sure if you've seen the movie, what is it called now, Contact with Jodie Foster. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, yeah. There is a guy in that movie who I think fits the the profile of a Terran because he's the one who blows up the, you know, this religious fundamentalist guy. Do you think that there are going to be, and perhaps this is where we can talk about the political divide between, you know, Terran, obviously, Cosmist, progressive, Terran, conservative, uh, we could talk about that, but do you think that there's going to be a religious motivation, a fundamentalism, extremism that is going to be the manifestation of this war that you foresee? Definitely. And I, I can speak from personal experience. Um, 
I've given lots of talks to various groups on the Cosmos Terran Artelect war type scenario. And typically at the end of the talk, I'll invite the audience to vote. You know, and I try and keep the question simple. So it's just a binary choice. So do you feel yourself, you know, asking the audience, do you feel yourself more Terran or Cosmist? And typically the answer would be 50, 50, 40, 60, 60, 40, and so on. So at first I thought, hmm, maybe the issue is so new that uh, people don't, you know, they haven't thought it through. They don't really have an opinion yet. And so, of course, then if that's the case, then they're voting randomly. And if they're voting randomly, then, of course, you expect more or less a 50-50 outcome. But gradually over time, I began to think, no, wait a minute. I'm getting people coming up to me a lot, and they're, ha they're expressing the same feeling and uh, commitment one way or the other, you know, Terran or Cosmos, as I am, because I'm torn. I'm terribly torn on this issue. And, and, and young you know, students have come up to me, for example, and say, oh, Professor, I'm so torn on this issue. On the one hand, I don't want to see humanity wiped out. On the other hand, there's a whole universe out there. You know, we want to build these godlike creatures. I'm torn because, you know, it's a, in a sense, it's a zero-sum game, maybe. And so <laughs> now, uh, I, I can give you the two extremes in, in terms of outcome on, on this vote. So... Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with a computer scientist. So I gave this talk to a bunch of, I think, 22-year-old uh, Chinese computer science master's students and asked them to vote. And have a guess what the outcome was. More uh, cosmist? Yeah, but how much? I'm going to lean on the, the, the large majority. Yeah, it was 80-20. Yes, you're right. Okay. Now, the other extreme, and I mean extreme, uh, let's see, five, five years ago, I, I got invited to, you know, to give this talk to a bunch of Midwest state, uh, a bunch of Christian evangelicals, mm -hmm. an audience of 3,000 people. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. You know, I mean, you, you know, you can talk on the internet, and you know, intellectually, that you, you're talking maybe even to a million people. But it doesn't have the emotional impact. But when you're in front of a real live audience of three thousand people, yeah. you know it's just it's just crushing. Anyway, so at the end, you know, I gave my spiel, and then I asked them, you know, vote. You know, so who's cosmics? Yeah, three thousand people, right? Huh. Maybe one or two hands went up. Oh yeah, there's a lot of peer pressure in that situation too. If oh. it's not an anonymous survey. Right. But but of course. but I, I I would assume that that's that's true because I mean I'm not sure if you're familiar with my channel. We talk about preparedness, survival, because I feel as though we're we're in like an age of consequences, if you will, where you have uh, potential for calamity and giga death, as you call it, everywhere. And I think that preppers and many you know this off grid movement. There's a lot of people who are you know, they're getting technologically averse and they're starting to get concerned about survival in an uncertain world, in a World War Three, post-World War Three world. Do you believe that this survivalist and preparedness movement is Terran-based? Uh, that, that's, for me, that's a, a specific question of a more general question. Um, Personally, I, I would like to see the establishment of a new branch of sociology that, that I call simply intellect sociology. And the task of that branch, this you know, subset of sociology, would, would be to answer questions like that. For, for example, is there a correlation between uh, being pro-cosmist uh, as a function of, say, generations of the two sexes, uh, you know, red or blue, you know, politics and so on. So we're get, getting back a little bit to, to the, you know, the 3,000 audience evangelicals. So, so I said, now, can, can the camera please uh, not uh, be directed towards me, but to the, towards the audience? And then I asked them, so who's Terran? 
3,000 hands went up <laughs> and it got recorded. And, and then I said, okay, you guys, you have spoken. This message will go to Washington, D.C. The, the evangelicals are strictly terrorists. And now that's a, you know, a valuable piece of information. The politicians will have to take that into account. Now, with uh, so maybe some ambitious, enterprising PhD student or, or a young um, you know, research professor can can pioneer this intellect sociology. You know, go out into the real world and, and start doing surveys and stuff. Uh, I, I, you know, I had a crack at it a bit a few years ago. Um, you know, there was definitely a, a correlation between being Terran and being religious. That that was clear. Uh, and, you know, the other extreme, you know, the computer scientists guys, uh, I suspect um, there'll be a correlation b between high intelligence and cosmist. Uh, I've had clues to that. You know, um, you know, if you have a very high IQ, you, you're you much more likely to be, be conscious of, you know, the universe and evolution and, and life billions of years old, and, you know, the bigger picture. So I, I suspect that will be true, but there, there needs to be a science behind it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, actual actual surveys. So whether whether for example preppers are more cosmist or Terran, but, uh, you know, just right now I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, it, it's an empirical question which I think you know could be settled simply by you know the appropriate surveys. So so I can imagine in time the uh, what are they called? You know, so survey companies, you know, there's some famous company names that, that do that sort of thing. They, they could go out into the streets and just ask people, you know, and, and you know, what category are you? You know, uh, you know female, religious, and, and, and what's your opinion on the Terran Cosmos, you know, polarity, blah, blah, and, and a, whole, a whole new branch of sociology uh, will, will spring up. That I'd very much like to see that, and I'm, I'm, I'm predicting that. Uh, but I've been pushing that every couple of years, but you know, most, especially sociologists, <laughs> they're not so tech savvy, and and for them, this is just science fiction. You know, they they don't take it seriously, and until now, until Chat GPT, now they are, because yeah. you know, you know sociologists uh, they tend not to be very mathematical. They're much more word. You know, they use words, and now that this GPT can write essays better than most of their students. <laughs> <laughs> that gets their attention. Yeah. Now they have no choice but to uh, see where people might stand on the issue. Uh, so in terms of uh, the politics of Terrence, I think it's safe to say that typically if you're talking about evangelical Christians, they're going to be voting on the right. And then you're going to have this cosmist alignment with the left and the whole progressive trans everything crowd you know i do foresee a, a divide along those lines um what impact do you think ai is going to have on this current geopolitical tension that's happening in the world between china russia it seems as though if i was to look at this objectively i would say that the the controversy surrounding the taiwan chip manufacturing company obviously chips are going to be essential for this the rise of ai and it seems like the United States is really trying to lock that in and prevent China from uh, developing uh, AI. But maybe before we, we talk about that question, I just have another question, because I heard you say recently in an interview that you thought that the government was at one point far more advanced in their AI research. Do you really believe that ChatGPT is the state of the art, or do you think that uh, the government has some program that's, uh, did they have the foresight to get ahead of this? Is ChatGPT just the commercial, watered down, diluted thing that we get, just kind of like how they invented the internet? And I mean, the, the military and the, the government, they, they pretty much invent almost everything and then it's commercialized do you think the same thing has happened here it's hard to say because they deliberately try to keep it secret of course yeah but I, I, do, I do remember in the 90s uh, i lived eight years in japan in the 90s and 12 years in china in the zeros and tens uh, in the 90s uh in one year i got visited by 
uh, are lots of uh, American generals and the military, the Navy, the Army, and so on. And they were very interested in, because what I was doing then was evolving, not, not programming, but evolving neural networks. So they were black boxes. I had no idea how they functioned, but they worked because they evolved. Like, like you create a, I don't know, a hundred neural nets and, and they're just, they use random weights, you know, the, the, the numbers connected with the, the connections, the synapses. So you give them some task, all hundred of them, and they get different scores. So you, you rank, you rank them by scores. You throw out the inferior half and you make copies of the superior half. And then you make random mutation, random changes. And most of the time, those random mutations to the weights, they will make the score go down. But occasionally, maybe 1% or so of the time, they'll make the score go up. So that means they, they rise in the hierarchy. So you, you keep looping this. It's, it's called a genetic algorithm. So I, I was doing that evolving neural nets rather than programming them using calculus. And uh, yeah, they were black boxes. I didn't understand how they functioned. They're way too complex in dynamics and structure, but they worked. So uh, so I got really excited. Oh my God, I can evolve motion controllers you know, using these circuits. I can evolve pattern detectors. I could evolve logic circuits. So I could put all these together and make a network of evolved networks. In other words, an artificial brain. And so, so then there's this whole, you know, uh, then I started, you know, this was my PhD work way back, the early 90s. And so I was thinking, my God, you know, if, if artificial brains can be made using this technology, this evolutionary engineering, then what could it do? Well, home robots and all that stuff, huge industry, and then the, the rise of artificial intelligence. And then I started thinking hard about species dominance. And it, it all just sort of logically followed. Because uh, you know, because of this one really important idea ahead of evolutionary engineering of neural nets, and then then I started uh, evolving them not in software, but in hardware, evolvable hardware. You, you just make random changes in in the hardware electrical connections, and so you could speed up the whole thing by oh, thousands or more uh, faster than software. So and uh, yeah, so these these these. You know, generals, yeah, that, God, they were hard as nails. You know, <laughs> I've been through 10 wars, you know, <laughs> kind of mentality. <laughs> but, man, they were interested. So what they did with it, I had no idea. So, you know, then there are all these so-called, you, you probably heard of the concept, black ops, OBS. Yeah. So God, know, you know, God knows what's going on underneath. I mean, the whole UFO stuff, and, you know. Yeah, and I mean they, they deliberately. If if it's going on, of course they want to keep it secret. So you know, it's it's hard to comment about it. What are they actually doing? Don't really know. So do you think the Chinese government? You're not in China now, so you don't have to worry about getting uh, scooped up. Um, do you think that they were doing something similar? That they actually did heed your warning? Maybe not openly, but they embarked on their own secret programs? Well, I know they are now because it's government policy. Um, Xi Jinping, you know, the current president of China, he's pushing very hard that, that China should not just catch up, yeah. but but dominate in, in uh, two dozen or so areas of uh, economic development, scientific development, uh, things like, you know, biotech. And AI is certainly one of them. And their aim is not not just to catch up to the West, but but to lead, you know, to, to dominate. And they may do that because if you look at the numbers of China, you know, they're, they're 1.3 billion people. They're smarter than us on average. They have an average IQ of 105. We Westerners, you know, Americans, Europeans, Russians, and so on, 100. So they're smarter than us. And and mathematically, if you take the the IQ bell curve, you know, and you shift it up by a mere five points, it has a huge impact on the number of genii that, that that culture can generate. So the potential of China is just fabulous. Uh, it, it, you know, given the population, imagine a whole city, a whole city of people with IQs in the top 1%. 
you know, that, that, that's, that's what's coming. As China really flourishes, they're smarter and they have a huge population. So for, for me, it's only a question of time before China just absolutely steamrollers over everyone. So do you think that China, uh, because before we get to that level of a global civil war, these conflicts between nation states have to be resolved in some way, shape or form. This multipolar world remains. So do you predict that there's going to be one country that comes out on top, homogenizes things, and then that's when this this uh, species war begins? Or is this something that happens at the same time? And I guess the other question attached to that would be, how is AI weaponized by nation states? This, you know, it's a really interesting question and a very difficult question. I mean, you talk about the future, right? So it's, it's hard. You know, people, you know, futurists are more, far more often wrong than right. Uh, I, I once wrote a, a book chapter essay uh, called How the Arctic War Starts. And so I stuck my neck out and I predicted that um, if, you know, several decades from now, so we imagine we're still in the era of nation states, then possibly uh, you may get a polarity of countries, you know, in terms of the Arctic Terran uh, cosmist polarity. Mm -hmm. And so you get government policy being, you know, one or the other, and hence the, the rivalry between nations on, on this question. Because I do, I do see this question dominating our global politics. I mean, what, what is more important to human beings, if you're Terran, than the survival of human beings? So it absolutely eclipses, you know, who should own capital and then such questions. So, so the passion level will be enormous. And so it's, it's possible, you know, you know it, it's hard to predict. It's so complicated. There's so many factors involved. But <clears throat> it is possible that uh, you, you may get countries polarizing along the spectrum of Cosmos and, and Terran. And, and we're talking, you know, 21st century weaponry, you know, far more deadly than, than what we had in the 20th century. And, it, you know, this, this issue may go, may go nuclear. And, you know, hence, hence what I call giga death. Uh, giga just means a billion. You know, that's a thousand million. So if you ask the question, you know, go back in a bit of history, uh, 20th century, how many people died for political reasons, you know, killed in, in World War I, World War II, ethnic cleansings, uh, Holocaust, and, and so on? And if you add them all up, the total's more or less about 300 million. Well, that, that's roughly a third of a billion. So if, big if maybe, if there's a major war later this century, you know, the, the Arctic War, then you don't have to multiply that number of a third of a billion by a big number. No, just a small number, three. And then you get to a billion. So with 21st century weapons, the, the passion level never being so high, because we're talking about the survival of a species now, not, not just the survival of a country. So, you know, you multiply by three and you get to a billion casualties. Well, I just relabel that. Giga, because giga just means a billion, giga, death. And it resonates. You know, people hate the concept. And it scares, it, now here, here I'm going to say it, it scares people shitless. Elon Musk, do you think he's a cosmist or a Terran? Whether he's cosmist or Terran? I mean, let me ask you, <laughs> where, where are you on this? <laughs> The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, where you'll find high-quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk, and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.